When the whole world's talking about hump day, I'm like, it's fucking mindset day. There's only a positive mindset today. So whatever that's going to be, whether it's when I'm attacking the barbell in the gym, going to attack my emails, if I'm feeling a bit a bit low, it's like, just just do your best today because you need a positive mindset. And if we're waking up Monday morning feeling sorry for ourselves that we've got, got to go to work, like what the fuck are we doing? You are a living, breathing example that if you focus on integrity first, you end up with a competitive advantage. The game that no one is playing right now is the honesty and integrity game. Oli motherfunking march on in the building. How are you doing, man? Mate, great. It's about time. I'm doing very well. I'm very pleased to be here. How are you doing, Chris? I'm good, man. This is such a long time coming. The internet is waiting for this. Mm. You feeling ready? Yeah, I'm, I'm born ready, man. I've been literally looking forward to this all, all week. Um, I've just had a cold shower just to wake myself up, make sure I'm primed and ready at my best. Um, let's get stuck into it. So first things first, you played rugby for England sevens, which was something that I only stumbled upon when you post like a throwback Thursday photo of a fresh faced Ollie from a, a half a decade ago. Um, what are some of the ways that playing high level sport at a young age shaped who you are today? It's a brilliant question. Um, firstly, address that bit. Yeah, I guess I guess anyone that sort of followed me of late over the last two, three, four years will only see me as like the fitness the fitness guy. Um, but prior to that, my 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 life was the be all and end all for me was was rugby. Um, I had a couple of spells as a, as a professional uh, rugby player, um, but my most successful one and in the I guess at the highest level was with England sevens. And that environment in itself is a very high pressurized environment. It's elite sport. Um, there's nowhere to hide. The, the game itself is very demanding, both mentally and physically. Um, you, it's a bit like the Formula One in terms of like a World Series. So you'll travel around, you travel around the world from place to place um, and you'll be away for sort of two to three weeks at a time. And then you'll be back in the UK in training camp for sort of six, six to eight weeks. Um, and during that time, uh, the way that the way England Sevens was set up is that we all sort of lived or the players that had to commute in would live uh, in a hotel in Teddington in, in London. So that environment, you, you know, you're, you're alongside the other players in, I guess, a, a nice hotel, but players digs for, to, to some degree. Um, you're in an environment where you just eat, sleep and breathing performance based sport. Um, you're using every waking moment to try and just get a little bit better, understand the game a little bit more. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a full time, it's a full time job. You're in the gym one minute, you're working your skills the other, you might be doing some conditioning at other times. And then when you are away from from home, that's you know quite tough as well because there's a fair amount of travel to do. There's a acclimatizing to the different time zones. There's then being able to lead up to the to the competition and and, and the tournament over, over the weekend. So that's uh, a new experience in itself. And then you're playing two to three games across a weekend or two or three days. So there's a fair amount of getting yourself up for a game, bringing yourself back down, having to recover, bring yourself back up. Then you know spent you know sleeping getting back up for day day two and anyone that's played rugby will know that there's a fair amount of knocks um, and when you're playing sevens which is at high speed it's almost you're taking the guys that are like just the best best athletes you know they're, they're big strong quick big engines ro very robust very resilient um, and you're putting them on a field where there's acres of space and just saying right like game on it's mad um, to think a rugby pitch is a pretty big bit of turf and then you you only have seven people per side to fill that with there's just bags and bags and bags of room i think yeah i think a lot of people that obviously follow me now with, with fitness the best thing i can liken it to is like a crossfit metcon that sort of four to seven four to six minutes i mean because games are seven minutes a half with like a i think it's two or three minutes half time maybe even less than that so it's seven minutes of nowhere to hide um yeah, intensity. There's 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 sprit, like acceleration, deceleration, a little bit of maybe catching your breath during you know during peak times. There's there's impact. There's there's tackles. There's rucks. There's having to catch. There's skill elements. So it's it's a bit like CrossFit in a sense. You know the tech you know, when you when you blend the technical lift, it requires you to link the whole kinetic chain. And then there's a bit where it's like on a on a on a salt bike where you need to rip it, and then you need to get ready to to, to do pull ups. And there's a strength element. It's it's a bit like that. It's, it's also, very very high demanding. Also, not far off three rounds of a UFC bout. Yeah, I mean, I mean <laughs> on, on, honestly, honestly, mate. When people, I guess, when people see some of the conditioning pieces or, or what I have done in the past, I, I'm not really like that so much anymore. Now I've got a bit older and maybe a bit wiser and other, other responsibilities. But when people see, do see some of the, the workouts and stuff that I've done, it's very much been influenced by. Um, my, my time during sevens you know and 
we talk about that environment. I went and did a, a training camp pre World Cup in Russia, Sevens World Cup in Russia in teens up in the Alps. So that was training at altitude. You know, Sevens training at altitude up in the mountains is, is just a different beast. Um, so yeah, it's 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 an incredible sport, but yeah, at, at that level and the very very highly elite athletes. Who is the biggest freak savage? that you saw during your time in sevens on the world circuit or who do you think are some of the most impressive athletes that you saw during your time playing and why? I think it was a, for me, it was a realization that I've always been quite fast. So coming from an athletics background, I'd always been a sprinter sort of county level, hundred meters, 200 meters, that sort of stuff. But when you get on a rugby field with uh, you know, sevens and I, I'll use someone like Dan Norton, who's uh, England's England sevens legend, um, that guy. So I was, I was a, a hybrid. I was a winger and I, and I play hooker. So I was like this utility player. And I, I guess that's the story of my my career in rugby throughout. Just this um, jack of all trades, master of none. I guess it leads into my fitness career. But when you're on, a, you know, on, the, on the pitch with someone like that and Carla Niles, these, these are top level sprinters. Like They could hold their own to some degree with, you know, on, a, on a track. And they just run away. Like they'll run away from you if you don't make if you don't get your positioning <laughs> right. Um, making it, you know, making a tackle. It was a baptism of fire training alongside Dan. Like particularly if I was, um, you know, in, tra- in training games, he's he's the starting winger. I'm marking him in defence. If I didn't get my tackle right on him, I was used to coming from a 15s background or just playing the seven circuit. I could turn and chase the guy down and make a tackle from behind. If someone like Nortz got around you, you're just eating dust. There's no point even chasing him. Um, <laughs> so you just let learn, him go. Yeah, you, well, you just, le- you just learn how to defend guys with, with footwork, with speed. Um, so that's someone, like, you know, someone that was in my position that I, that I train with day to day. Of course, like he, he's one of the fastest guys on the circuit. There, there, there are others that are up there. Um, and then I, I actually had my debut in, in, in Dubai and the two teams in our group was South Africa and Samoa. Uh, and there was, a, there was a third team as well, Portugal. But I was playing, again, hooker and wing. I remember coming onto the field and scrummaging down at, at hooker. So you're in the, there's three versus three, and it's basically like a, you know, it's a, it's a man test. Uh, these, the scrums aren't very long. It's just basically who can, who can have that biggest initial impact, get the ball out, and we, and we crack on. And when you're packing down at five foot nine, I was about 86 kilos at the time against three big Samoans and South Africans. <laughs> like I said, I, w- I, woke, I wake up, I wake up day two, mate, and I, 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 my neck had never felt anything like. Trying to just twist and turn my head, I'd never felt anything like it. They really, yeah, it really is. It's a, it's a complete test of of speed, physicality, endurance, strength, power, um, and it, it's really shaped who I've, you know, my, my view on fitness and and, and what I, why I why I've become this sort of like generalist in terms of fitness. And I guess why my style of training fits very well, well within the, the CrossFit functional fitness space, because it's a true test across all different modalities. How much has your rugby sevens background influenced how quick you can run after your toddler son? <laughs> Mate, funnily enough, my wife always beats me to run after him. <laughs> um, just, a, just a mother's instinct. Um, yeah, I think my rugby sevens background has influenced a lot, like a lot in my life. I think, I think um, maybe not so much parenting, but definitely, but definitely, the, like I said, the way I view fit, fitness and the way I just view day to day, putting myself in the firing line, very high pressure environment, looking for challenges, and knowing that, yeah, putting myself in an environment where you make one mistake and that could cost cost you the game. You, know, you miss a tackle on a sevens field and that guy is, is getting through. And uh, unless your sweeper inherently, your, your, number, your scrum half is, is going to make that tackle, it, it falls on you. Um, so that is uh, a lot of faith in your own ability. I think so. I, well, I, I, I liken it to the, the environment right now as well with, with this COVID thing and, and people saying, how are you feeling about it? And I've just got so much faith in my own ability more so in my work ethic than than my ability because i think a lot of the and again I'm, i might i may do myself a disservice when i talk about this sort of stuff but i never had uber amounts of talent you know i was never the tallest the biggest the strongest the quickest uh, i had a i developed a work ethic from a very young age instilled you know, on me by my by my father um i at times i took some of my talents for granted and that then led to some shortfalls when i got injured in in my initial uh, stint, stint as a rugby player so I got injured and I, I couldn't play for, for 12 to 18 months. And and that taught me a few life lessons as well about not taking things for granted. Um, I've alluded to this in the past that growing up, my my all I wanted to be was a professional athlete. 
Um, and once I got that, you know, you, you sort of get to the top of the mountain. You know, I'm no, I was nowhere near the top of the mountain, but I got that professional tagline or so I uh, so I thought I then started taking things for granted didn't do the work um, didn't put in the extra hours didn't go above and beyond all these things that now I do to the nth degree got injured realized that you know I wasn't I wasn't invaluable and I could you know they could just push me to the side and, and the next minute I was waking up in university halls as a um, as a as a, as a fresher while well, I actually went traveling in Thailand but and then and then I'm a fresher and then I'm you know my life was completely changed and turned upside down from being a professional athlete and that 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 taught me a few life lessons how much do you think the lessons that your dad taught you are to do with his heritage because you're is it subcontinental is it Indian what is it Mm, massively massively that I actually been thinking more of this I'm gonna maybe go a little bit of a tangent with the whole Black Lives Matter thing because I've done a lot of thinking about my own personal experiences growing up as a person of color. Um, now, a lot of people, even today, someone said to me, "Jesus, you're tanned. Like, where have you been?" You know, a lot of people now might just see me as a as a as a as a you know Caucasian that's just got a, a pretty ex- extreme a tan. Wicked bit of color in him, yeah. yeah but- but but when I was younger, I, I was I was subject to to, to racism and 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 um, not not massively, but. Again, it's a bit of a tangent, but I've done a lot of thinking about my culture growing up and how my, my relationship was with my dad. And yeah, that's definitely shaped who I am today. There, I think there was a, a work ethic installed in my, my dad was a was a surgeon. Um, I think this was passed down to him from his father. The legend goes in my family that my granddad, I never got to meet him. He actually uh, decided what my uncles and aunties would go and study. So my dad obviously went went into medicine. Um, my eldest uncle, he became a priest. Um, and coincidentally, since then, he's um, he became an alcoholic and he, he died, passed passed away of, of, of being an alcoholic. I don't know whether that's linked to upbringing and, and maybe he, the career in which he went into or, or certain, other, certain other issues. But my dad's side of the family are very high achievers. And I, I don't mean that just purely monetary. I mean that by, you know, they, they push their needle hard. Um, very successful in in business, and my dad was very successful in his in, in medicine. Um, and I think being the eldest son, um, there was a lot of pressure on my shoulders. Uh, I, I studied psychology, chemistry, biology at A level because I you know I thought I had to go and be you know become a doctor. I soon realised that that wasn't for me when I got my grades back. Um, that just that that learning rugby, environment. Rugby seems a little bit safer option than this than this doctoring. <laughs> this doctoring shit sounds a bit hard. Yeah, but uh, there, there was definitely there's definitely you know, an, an element of that in, imposed on me. I think some families, like I said, I never had a, I didn't have a tough upbringing. I was very fortunate. My I, w- I never wanted for anything, but that my dad was very disciplinary and he was very authoritative. There was um there was a you know there were times when myself and him very much clashed, particularly when I got into my teenage years and I you know got a little bit bigger, a little bit you know a little bit more cocksure of myself. We, we really did, did really did clash. Um, and I think the communication between the two of us was poor for for a number of years because we just didn't see eye to eye on things. But now I'm a bit older, a bit a bit wiser, and I can look back at what he did install in me. I'm I'm incredibly grateful for. Um, I took my first job at 14 years old, and and they were all things that you know I I, I think were inst- instilled in me from from my father. One of the things that you mentioned was about having faith in your future self. And I got a, a buddy, a real character, a guy called Andrew Tate, who is a son of a chess grandmaster, world champion kickboxer, multi-millionaire, living in Romania, driving fat. He's like a real-life genius James Bond meets Dan Bilzerian. He's this, got a brother. He's got a brother, right? Tristan, yeah. Um, yeah, I know, so, I know of him. Um, he put this thing up. Some of his stuff, he posts uh, rap lyrics. The rap lyrics are less so for me, but some of the stuff that he puts up has absolute pearls of wisdom in, and he did this one about um i don't care about spending money i don't care about deciding to buy this car or those shoes or this house or that dog or take this girl out or do any of that stuff i have faith that future andrew will make it work that if i decide to spend my money now the andrew in the future will make it work no matter what happens and that really stuck with me this idea of having so much trust in your future self that you have uh, expanded your domain of decision making in the present to account for what you know is a capability in the future. And I think one of the problems that a lot of people have is that when they consistently make promises to themselves that they break, 
I'm going to stop drinking this year. I'm going to stop cheating on my boyfriend this year. I'm going to lose weight, do this, do that. Every time that you make one of those promises to yourself and you break it, your brain keeps note. Your mind mm. knows that you said, imagine that you're friends with someone and this friend keeps on turning up late or doesn't arrive at dinner. After a little while, you'd be like, I, I'm not inviting you out for dinner anymore because I don't trust that you're even going to show up. You have to see yourself as that friend, right? You are a friend to yourself in a very real way. We talk to ourselves. Our inner monologue occurs as if we're talking to somebody else. What did you do that for? That was a stupid thing to do, you know? And I think that what you appear to have tried to cultivate here is over time expanding that domain of competence so that you have faith that you will be able to do those things in future, right? Future Ollie will get it sorted. Yeah, com com completely. I think it's having faith in whatever your talent is or whatever your passion is, it's really doubling down on that. And then if you can apply some work ethic with that, uh, and, and be confident in it. For for me, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot recently as well. For me, I just I want to I work as hard as I can to try and get a seat at the table in whatever industry or whatever table that might be at. And I know it's a bit of like an analogy there, but if I can get a seat at the table, then I've got a chance to eat and I've got a chance to listen to the to the people that are at that table that know more than me in whatever particular field that may be. And I get a chance to network with those people and communicate with them. Um, and whether it's in fitness, whether it's in business, whether it's in a, you know, listening to, you know, the chance to come on this podcast, you know, the, the, the guests that have come before me, you know, are people, you know, that I, I'm, I'm happy to say these are some incredible people that have released books, that, you know, huge followings. But I managed, what I've done, I've managed to get a seat at the table on the Modern Wisdom podcast. Do, do you know what I mean? And it's the same with, it's the same when I, I get an opportunity to, to sit and, and, and just listen or take in information from guys that are in the financial world or understand a little bit more about business, understand a little bit more about marketing and understand more about fitness than, than me. So if I can continue to show that people can trust in me, you mentioned that piece there about, you know, always the people that, that are flaky, you know, you won't ever get that from me. I will always show up and you can always trust in me to be there for, and, and do what I say I'm going to do. Um, and, but I think because of that, the people then buy into you know, who I am and what I'm about. And like I said, that gives me a seat at the table. If I can get a seat at the table, I get a chance. I get a chance to eat and I get a chance to listen and I get a chance to network and I get a chance to grow. I get a chance to be a little bit uncomfortable with my with my company. And then, you know, I level up. You, you've got to catch up with them, right? It's, yeah. it's interesting to hear from someone who purposefully puts themselves into situations where they're out of their depth. And I think one of the real reasons why your audience resonates with you online, and I know that I do as well, is that authenticity. I, I hope that it's one of the reasons that the audience listening to this podcast enjoy this as well, that I try not to mince my words. I make a point of never, ever cutting an episode unless there's something libelous or a connection dropout. I don't, I don't ever fettle with it. So I forget a word. I say the wrong thing. There's, this episode with Daniel Schmachtenberger where there was 20 seconds of pure silence. And I was like, nah, that's staying in because he meant it to be in there. Um, I want the audience to have faith that what they get is what happened. And I think mm -hmm. the same thing for you with the people that you work with. It's like, if you want to put your faith in me, if you ask me to turn up as a husband, a father, a business owner, a coach, an athlete, an ambassador, whatever it might be, I'm going to do it. You want me to do a thing and I'm going to do it. And Given kind of the last few years of the Instagram influencer world, and obviously I've contributed to this terribly with the uh, go from zero to hero Love Island reality TV uh, transformation that happens where people are chosen for not their talent, simply their presence. Um, the You can pick someone up like uh, um, Tommy Fury. He was great on Love Island and became like this world or national star and no one cared about how good he was at the thing he dedicated his life to. Mm. What does that teach us? It teaches us that fame doesn't actually to be need to be being famous for anything. Fame is about notoriety by any means. And I really think that there is a counterculture now that people are resonating with, and it's virtuous, integrity-driven content that is meaningful and, and honest and truthful. And as you see Instagram testing out removing the like count, 
from underneath posts and rolling that out across the world, that is going to further increase people's likelihood of posting things which to the creator makes sense, to the creator feels like it resonates. They might care about how many comments they get that are meaningful as opposed to the like counter that's underneath the post. And what this kind of all loops around to is that you are a living, breathing example that if you focus on integrity first, you end up with a competitive advantage. Going for the lowest common denominator and just trying to pick the easiest fruit that you can works, but everyone can do that. The game that no one is playing right now is the honesty and integrity game. Yeah, because I think within time, people see through all of that stuff. And if there's no substance beyond it, then then that's where the, you know you, there's nothing there's nothing then to, then to follow. And I think with the with that whole thing i don't need i don't want or desire at all to have tens of thousands hundreds of thousands millions of followers what i what i really what really you know gives me enjoyment fulfillment is the connections so i'd rather have a much smaller following that i can actually connect with and going back to that analogy like if i can get a seat at the table with x y and z and these people that are higher level and i can take from it and then i can like give to my 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 people and and give them like that tangible connection to it because not everyone's going to get these sort of chances in life for one reason or the other so if i can leverage my talents my work ethic my drive my you know ability maybe just to talk you know talk a good game until i get to get to that table and then go and help yeah and then yeah exactly and then go and help the people that that have supported me on the way then i'm doing my job it's like um yeah, for me, it's it's just about connections, and you soon see that people people that follow my social media, yeah, you know, my stories in particular, the way the way the way I run my stories, there's going to be some value in there every now and again, fluttered in. There's a bit of my son, there's a bit of my wife, there's a bit of just me resharing all you know, the the amazing community that we've built that engage in our fitness. There's a lot um, of brownies. There's a lot of food. It, but then there's a lot of but there's a lot of food, and it's the same it's the same shite every day, right? And <laughs> I just, like I've, I've alluded to this in the past, it's definitely not an exciting thing to follow when I post a picture of a salad. But it's the same people that will actually show up and watch my picture of the salad that I actually care about following me. Do you know what I mean? Because they're like, I'm holding myself accountable to things that I do every day by posting this salad. I know you find it fucking boring, but thanks for actually showing up and still following and supporting. Like, this is this is my journey. It's my accountability tool and you're still following it. You still watch it. Yeah. And the thing um, is as well, when you decide to do that if you decide to consistently give to the audience they will give back to you and this doesn't just happen for content creators it's all well and good me and you as two people that have to produce or choose to produce content every day but this goes for everyone that's listening your um, relationship with your mother or your um, children you know, your parents or your children, you want to have a reciprocal relationship. You want them to have faith that you're going to do the things that you say that you're going to do. And when it comes from a business entrepreneurial sense, I wish, I wish that I'd realized 10 years ago that going wide and shallow is nowhere near as effective as going narrow and deep. I would much Mm -hmm. sooner be the best podcaster in Europe within the wisdom space than try to be F- fucking uh, model DJ club promoter reality TV info you know what I mean I don't I don't need all that I need the thing that I love and I want to become great at it and you know thankfully what you have or at least it appears to and we're going to get onto this now as a lifestyle kind of aligns in one way or another but one of the things that I find most fascinating about yourself is that you are athlete businessman coach family guy as in dad and husband and brother and son and all of this stuff you appear to have quite a hectic like classic subcontinental uh family thing like tons of extended family there's all it's always like every other week someone's birthday or a barbecue or something like that um what are the things that you do to ensure that you keep all of this aligned everyone that watches your stuff getting up with shark mentality 4 30 in the morning like how do you piece this routine together Good question. Um, and then, you know, sometimes I don't really, sometimes I don't really know. Sometimes I feel as though I fall short on some of those elements. You know, if, if we look at, you know, who I identify as now and you've, you've listed off a, a fair amount there, so I liken it again to playing, you know, spinning plates or turning, turning the dimmer switch up at certain times. There are certain times of the day in which I need to, I really need to turn the, the dimmer switch up on being a coach because I'm in front of people and I'm coaching. Then it's my time to train. So that's when I just need to block out my time and just get my, you know, get the work done that I need to get done. When I'm back home, 
I do find it very difficult to try and switch off and be present around my family. That's something I, I really need to still develop. And, you know, just because I am a father, a businessman, a, a, an athlete and all these things, it doesn't mean I'm very good at all of them. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. There's, there's times in which I really do get it wrong. Um, and then I, but I have good people around me that will tell me. Um, and that we have an honest conversation. Uh, I'm pretty good. I'm, I'm pretty self-aware as well. So I'll do a lot of self-reflection on how I'm, how I, how I think I performed a certain day or a certain week on certain tasks, and and then I'm, I'm able to maybe adjust and, and remodel myself for the week to come. Um, but I think you so you mentioned about you know Shark Mondays and that sort of thing. For me, that, those little bits are just it's just the narrative. I think when it comes when it, we link it this to mindset. When I was a when I was a, a rugby player or just a personal trainer, there was never any anxieties about what I was doing day to day, because I was just so, in I just enjoyed every moment of waking up and being a professional athlete. Until of course I decided that I was going to walk away from that. Same with personal training, like I never really viewed it as work. I was just in a gym which I'd created my first my first gym, and just coaching people. It was re- it was really sort of flow state. When I'm on the gym floor, I I, I find it really easy. When I transitioned to business owner and the other bits and pieces which you have to sort of learn about, you know, like being a being a husband and being a father and those sort of things, then anxieties and, and stresses and, and and more weigh Felt on the you. Burn but, there, didn't you? Yeah. So so for me, I, I never on a Sunday night like most people used to get that. Oh, it's Monday morning tomorrow when it when it, when I was playing rugby. It's like oh, I cannot wait for it to be to be to be Monday. I never used to get that that hump day thing on a Wednesday because. I just didn't have that slump. And you get these people that are employees that work a nine to five and they're just living for the weekend. That was never me. But when it moved into being a more owner operator of a gym business and all these other things that I then had to try and teach myself or learn about, I started to get these, these, these feelings of like, Oh shit, I've got to get back. I've got to do, you know, I've got to answer emails. I've got these things that didn't really come very naturally to me. I didn't really enjoy. So just to change the narrative in my head, like if you, if you wake up, and the first thing you think to yourself is, I'm going to be a fucking shark today. You know, you, you do, whenever a negative thought creeps into your head, it's like, hang on, no, 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 like sharks don't think like that. You know, I know it's a, it's a child, maybe a childish way to put, put a spin on things. And mindset day, like Wednesday, whenever, when the whole world's talking about hump day, I'm like, it's fucking mindset day. And uh, it's, there's only a positive mindset today. So whatever that's going to be, whether it's when I'm attacking the barbell in the gym, whether it's whether I'm going to attack my emails whether it's how you know if i'm feeling a bit a bit low it's like just just do your best today because you need a positive mindset and then i find myself getting through the week and i'm like that's the weekend made chill look what i've look what i've like achieved so i i, I put out the other day you know uh, we live out the narrative each day that we sort of tell ourselves and if we're waking up monday morning feeling sorry for ourselves that we've got, got to go to work like what the fuck are we doing you know, ch- change the story or just change, like change, tip your life upside down and leave your job because that's no way to exist. And I think particularly people have found during COVID because they've done, done a lot of self-reflection, at least they should have, is that people are just existing and enduring life and letting life, letting life employ them. They're employed by their employer and they're employed by life and they live nothing on their terms. So mindset day shark monday that's my way you know i'm you know you, you're a big man on morning routines and i'm sure yours is fairly a lot more polished than mine but it's my my way of setting my intention for the day this is how i'm going about it i'm on the front foot i you know we say we you talk about you know win, win the morning win the day i'm i'm winning my first thought and on sunday that. night when i'm when i'm preparing myself to go to bed i'm like fucking shark monday let's get it yeah exactly there's yeah. two equivalents that people listening to this podcast may be familiar with um james altucher past modern wisdom guest has a fantastic blog post called not useful and not useful is an ongoing uh, mental tool he uses the same as your shark mondays so whenever a thought creeps into his mind that he doesn't want in there something negative uh, negative self-talk a concern an anxiety a fear he labels it realizes that he's thinking this thing labels it as not useful is it useful not useful and then allows it to go like mm. why are you thinking a thing if it's not useful to you it genuinely isn't do you want to be worrying about whether or not that tax bill that's due in a month and a half's time is actually going to get done are you going to worry about whether or not your boss is going to be not useful if it happens, you'll deal with it when it happens. There's this uh, quote that I tweeted yesterday from Shane Parrish as well, guy behind Farnham Street. It's not who you think you are or who you want to be. You are what you do consistently. 
It's not enough to say the right words or even think the right things. You have to act on them. Mm. Yeah, it's br- uh, power. It's brilliant. I mean, everything you just said. It, it, I think when it comes to these things, I've been an early adopter of of all of these things, not n- unknowingly. Um, you know, my, the things with the mindset, the things with you know, fitness orientated stuff. You know, go, I'm going back sort of 10 years. Behavioral science stuff is now. I'm not saying it's caught up. I'm not saying I was a, a ahead you of the are curve. A tra- Mate, Ollie Marchand is a trendsetter. You heard <laughs> it here first. I guess what I'm saying is by by default, I've because I've got an awareness of these of these things or, or how I wanted to try and thrive in my life and the things I needed to do to try and get there, I started to implement and I started to put things in place. And then they naturally, I guess, then get led to a bit more success. Some things didn't work. There's been times where I've really burnt myself out and got it completely wrong because I just didn't know what I was doing. Um, and then as things become more and more evident, more research and more more work gets put into the way people behave and what how they should behave, then I'm like, oh, shit, like that's something I've, I've, I've kind of been doing. I've not been doing it quite right, but um, I've, I've done my, my, my version of it. Yeah. One of, the things you, one of the things you mentioned was that you iterate on self-reflection. And what you can presume is it doesn't really matter whether you're a bookworm or not, whether you're consuming hours of podcasts every week and little audible subscription maxed out and all this stuff, AirPods never leave your ears, all this shit. It doesn't really matter about that because you've, identified that over the last decade you've allowed an evolution of ideas and a survival of the fittest in terms of mindset approaches ways of dealing with business small failures haven't knocked you off you've allowed them to be what they are okay that's a lesson i'll try not to repeat it and the good things that you've done you've allowed to stay with you and what that's allowed you to do over time is to iterate this evolution of ollie's mind which mm. now has inevitably come upon some of the stuff that research says, because if what you had found disagreed with the research, there's more research to be done because you're apparently some uh, well of unique information, insight. Of course, that's going to be the case. If you exist in the world for long enough, you would be able to stumble across pretty much all of the insights of science. You would just need to look at things with sufficient dexterity so that you would actually end up real, oh, well, this is how motivation works, or this is why you've got uh, ego depletion and willpower is actually finite. But perhaps if I have a nap, willpower could come back. Like You don't need to run tons and tons of focus groups. You just need enough time and enough attention to actually work out what's going on. And that's why, as you say, over time, you've allowed yourself as a coach, businessman, dad, all this sort of stuff, to uh, these emergent realizations have occurred. And now... I think you've started to layer on top some more uh, consumption of books, of podcasts, of audiobooks, of mm. uh, coaching the uh, coaches association you're a part of, Nike Master Trainer, all these people you're exposing yourself to. And that's when you're going to really start to level up, right? Yeah, I think you know, just on the research thing, like, research is always there just to fit someone's bias. And also it only becomes relevant when there's like a, a problem they need to fix. Um, I, I didn't want to be, I didn't want to, I never wanted to be a part of that cohort of the, the problem they need to fix. So I wanted to try and get, I guess I, by, by trying to be ahead of it and trying to adopt all these principles and things that were, there was whispering, you know, this might work, but it might be a complete waste of time. There might be no science and stuff behind it. Well, let's just give it a go. Why not? I'm my own experiment. Uh, I've got nothing to lose other than just a bit of learning. And the learning thing I think is really important here. Like most people struggle with the the notion of putting in more effort to things, whether it's their fitness, whether it's their relationships, whether it's the, the, the way they view their nutrition, what they do with their nighttime routine or going to bed or all those kind of things. Like effort is where people actually lack, but effort is where the body just learns. Same with the people that you're trying to teach a press up to three years after they do their first press up. Like why can't you just accept the fact that just think a little bit more about what we're trying to do here when we're trying to connect the full body to move as one like one piece. They'd rather just bang out the reps as fast as they can and think that moving through something faster is going to be better. Surely that's that, that's going to be better for me. No. Take your time, slow down, think about what you're trying to achieve and your body will learn and therefore you can move on to you get the prerequisites to move your press up onto the next thing. I mean, I'm using press up as an example here. Very basic, of course, but the point being that through more effort becomes more learning and that's where then you get to a level where 
the learning might need to change. It might not be, I, I can't just keep experimenting on myself. I then need to start, you know, re- read, read, put this into context, read the latest literature. That's the advantage of you having a brother, right? That you can just, just start experimenting on him. See if this works. <laughs> just mate, can you grow a moustache for me, please? See if your lifts go up, put this cap on backwards. See if your lifts go up, slightly shorter shorts, slightly longer socks. Exactly that, mate. That's exactly what Charlie he, he exists for. He's my little uh, guinea, my pig. little rat, lab rat. <laughs> Sorry, Chaz. Um, yeah, I love that man. And uh, pushing yourself into those areas of discomfort is something that, for some people, if you're more Type B, is is going to be a challenge. Whereas relinquishing that, if you're Type A, is going to be a challenge. So let's talk about some of the times where you've perhaps either pushed yourself too hard, or how you are, how you've learned over time when you are pushing too hard and some of the mindset approaches that you're using to uh, give yourself that breathing room to say, okay, Ollie, like 60 hours of work this week is enough or this many miles, this many calories, you know, how have you uh, allowed yourself to let go of that tether? Yeah. So let's address the, I guess the sort of learnings I've had, I've had along the way. Like I said, when I, when I was in the rugby environment, when things, a lot of things were done for you, like your, your output was monitored You'd wear GPS trackers. Your your program was was prescribed for you. Your your nutrition was looked after. It's a very safe environment. You can't really get things very wrong unless there's a, a um, an injury or something that is just a freak accident. But when I moved into being a personal trainer um, and and running my own business, I was I've never been employed by anyone in the fitness industry. So I, I worked myself from the get go. There's no one really teaching you about how many hours of, of good delivery you can do, how that then fits into your own training, how that fits into your sleep. At the time when I first started, I was, I was, I used to drink, I used to party and go out at weekends, all that kind of stuff. So you get it wrong, right? And you, 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 you drop the ball somewhere. And then when I did finish playing rugby and I moved into owning my own gym, um, I put all of my, that work ethic, that drive, that passion, that, uh, tenacity into trying to run a business um and yeah i burnt myself out i just got it completely completely wrong i i got it spiraled out into a into a stage where if i wasn't actively sat down working on my business quote unquote my only other outlet that i knew about was training or f- some sort of physical pursuit or endeavor so i found myself going on ridiculously long runs swimming doing endurance stuff because i could fill time that meant i didn't need to sit down because if I sat down, I had to be doing work of some sort. Were you with your missus at this point? Yeah, and so so I was with my missus. My missus, uh, yeah, with, with Loz. She was um, she was working as a air hostess at the time for BA, which again is a is a horrific job. I feel for anyone that works as a as an air hostess. She'd done it because she wanted to see the world. She you know, went to some amazing places, but of course, when you've got a, a boyfriend or someone back home, you don't, never get the chance to switch off yourself. Or you know, a lot of the, the, those guys that thrive in that environment, or, or girls, or guys and girls that thrive in that environment, will then come back to the UK and just sleep and wait for the next next shift. Whereas Loz was coming back, trying to spend time with me. I was overworked, overstressed, and we almost split up, mate. Like, it's genuinely, we, we almost we got to a stage where our relationship was really, really bad. We decided to move in together. Um, it was a great decision. A few, a few months later, she she fell pregnant. Um, but anyway, I've digressed slightly. So that was a time in which, in which you know, I, I soon learned that I'm if I if I carry on this way, I need to organise my life a little bit better so I don't I don't burn myself out. What I've began to put in place since then is just a, a greater level of self awareness and self care, um, a greater level of, of ability to try and build up the other side of my arch. And and this happens. Had this happened through a, through a mentor of mine at the time who was saying, you know, being a Taipei person, person, always looking for that challenge. Like my whole day is about challenges because what I re- you know, what being an athlete, it's about winning, right? So you you know what the you know what the challenge is, whether it's game day, you know what you know how you need to win in terms of the metrics and the scores. So I'd look for that challenge, tick that one off. It's like yes, dopamine hit. Like I'm a beast. Where's the next challenge? Who wants it next? Type thing. But that again, that 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 will only take you down, you know, one 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 path, and eventually that path is there's going to be a dead end, and you need to reverse. So, yeah, they, something they said to me is about just trying to find a bit more flow, um, and that doesn't come very easy to me. It's a, it, for me, it was about trying to find a hobby that was outside of fitness. You know, even things like puzzles and chess, as, as stupid as this sounds, like it, that those things never right, quite clicked with me. But I guess spending a little bit more time with my son. That was that, that that allowed me to find flow going on, you know, look, reading, reading books and listening to podcasts and going, going on walks and being in nature and, and just doing things that weren't, 
uh, formal forms of exercise, which is all I knew about, or sitting behind a laptop and trying to push business ideas. I also will add to that, like I do have a, I, I seem to have a, a large capacity for work. And the boys that are very close to me at, at the gym, you know, Alex, our head coach, he's always telling me that he's like, your brain just works on this, on this level of a uh, capacity that I, yeah, he can't keep up. And sometimes I'll, when we have our meetings, I'll be like, this, 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 and this. And he's like, where's this all come from? And I guess it's just my, a, a bit of a reactive nature, a bit of a, um, it's wanting to just keep, keep everything moving. I guess it's ingrained now in the culture of March on. It's like, just, just keep going, keep moving. <laughs> yeah. It's um, an, but, an appropriate but, surname, right? People around me, you know, people around me rein me in when, when I need to, when I need to be. Having that support system, it must be a big change. And as someone who independently has a similar mindset to yourself, always never, never had a job for anyone that wasn't me. 18 years old, started running my own business, very quickly attached my sense of self-identity and self-worth to the success of the business, found it challenging to detach that, then went another step further. This second order effect is really pernicious. And there may be some entrepreneurs who haven't heard me talk about this before that are listening. Um, if you begin to attach your sense of success to the amount of suffering associated with the process of doing work, you have gone too far. So I used to have a successful club night, 1,500 people, really amazing door take, accounts look fantastic, great reviews, no problems. But if it had come easy to me, I'd feel guilty and I'd go home feeling unfulfilled because there was mm. some part of me that felt like suffering was innate in success and that I needed to suffer. And it's a Puritan work ethic. You can imagine these priests uh, doing hoeing the gardens and self-flagellation in service to God, right? It's a Puritan work ethic. And that's what I had. I was sacrificing myself in service to this desire to be something. But the problem was I'd completely missed the bit that mattered. I wasn't even chasing success anymore. And success should be in service to happiness. So I'd bypass both success and happiness and was just looking at, for the pain and for the suffering. And what it sounds like you've done is begin to build some structures in place, forcing functions that mean that you have to do the walk, the family time, the hike, the support structure, the uh, second cousin's birthday, whatever it might be. Um, and when you then reintegrate that with flow, there's this great quote from uh, Kyle Eschenroder, who was the, the podcast I did the other day that I know that you've listened to. And um, he talks about Confucius, ancient philosopher, Eastern philosopher, talking about um, how you first have to use the type two thinking, the slow, and then it integrates into the fast. In the early stages of training, an aspiring Confucian gentleman needs to memorize entire shelves of archaic texts, learn the precise angle at which to bow and how the lengths of steps are that he is to enter a room with. His sitting mat must also almost be perfectly straight. All of this rigor and restraint, however, is ultimately aimed at producing a cultivated but nonetheless genuine form of spontaneity. Indeed, the process of training is not considered complete until the individual has passed completely beyond the need for thought or effort. And that's what every training plan is trying to achieve. You're trying to instantiate habits which you could have naturally come upon. We mentioned this before. You've happened upon some good mindset tricks, some good mm -hmm. mindset approaches that have then been reflected in literature down the line. And this is the same thing again. There will be someone out there, maybe someone who's listening, who happened upon the perfect cadence of work, rest, family, relax, entertainment. Perhaps myself and you and a lot of the other people, almost everyone who's listening, hasn't. Therefore, we got to work at it. But after you've done the work, you can actually then allow yourself to be more free flowing with it. You understand your limits more intuitively rather than uh, kind of academically. Does that make sense? Complete, complete sense. Yeah, I think you have to you have to live through it to understand where I get understand where in in all of those things you're trying to identify as like where the priorities actually lie. Um, live through it and then come up with your you know the the best version of the best iteration of it for you. And that then then might that then might might change because priorities may change. Other things might come in. It goes back to that A and B testing we we sort of alluded to to earlier. 
the things that, that serve your life and that are working, you keep them in. The things that aren't, you change them. If you're dropping the ball somewhere and be be willing to have those difficult conversations with the people that mean the most to you. Because that constructive criticism from your wife, your best mate, your business partner, your employees, that actually helps you be better at the thing in which you're trying to get better at. If you're just left to your own devices, you know, me and you are quite similar in personalities. If you're left to your own devices, you just... Yeah, you're probably going to get it wrong. You have to be willing, like willing to take on the criticism um, and and imp- implement it and have those difficult conversations. That's the place that you get the growth as well. So some of the things that I've noticed recently, I was on Michaela Peterson, Jordan Peterson's daughter's podcast last week, and her YouTube channel has significant reach, which meant that there was a lot of comments of people who were hearing me for the first time. And I was questioning myself. I was like, do I... Do I read these? Do I read them? Yeah, I'm going to. And sure enough, went through and tons of people have picked up on things that I've never realized. A bunch of vocal tics that I've got, some imprecisions in my speech, some pauses where there shouldn't be, little bits and pieces. Now, most of these are trolls online who are not doing this from a virtuous standpoint. And it was painful for me to read some of that stuff. (laughs) But I've not realized some of these lessons in 200 years episodes, two and a half years of doing this podcast, probably 300, 400 hours of recording content. And yet I had to have this uncomfortable experience in order for me to be able to deal with it. Another podcast I did with Jason Calacanis, J Cal, who's this huge Silicon Valley investor. And he made it quite uncomfortable. He has got a very, very big following and made the podcast a little bit, not confrontational, but it was at least adversarial. And I learned more in that one episode than I've learned in 20 or 30 of the ones where it's just easy and free flowing. Yeah, they're great, but I don't actually expand my competence there. And again, this is why leaning into discomfort, as we spoke about earlier on, almost actively seeking that discomfort, even in the areas you don't want to feel it. So in an area of having a difficult conversation, Yeah, it's difficult. Why is it difficult? Because it is outside of your domain of competence. But once you do it, that is now, that box is ticked. I have that capacity. I know that if I need to approach my coach because he keeps on turning up late and I know that it's because he's got a a young daughter or son or whatever and it's going to be real hard and it's all multifaceted. And this is what everyone, there's uh, there's always a reason why my, my situation is different when I have to have an awkward conversation with someone that works for me or a friend or whatever it might be. It's like, no, it's not. It's just maybe a little bit more nuanced. Go and do the work. Go and speak mm. to the person. Have the difficult conversation because it will make you grow. I think um, to give you peace of mind, just personally, like, and what you said about you know, reading those comments and stuff, and anyone that's sort of going to read negativity or want to take on you know, criticism, which is a good thing to do, so long as you, you can sleep easy at night, so long as everything you do comes from one, a place of good intention, and two, like, there's no lack of effort. Like, there's, there, there is definitely uh, an incredible amount of deliberate practice and and, and the utmost of of effort into everything that you do. And I think most people there is, so you can read those comments and it's right. Like read them and take on the criticism and read them and and have an air of vulnerability. If you don't, if you're not willing to be vulnerable to, to, to you know, people that, that are going to give you con- constructive criticism or, or challenge your belief system, challenge the way you do things, then a, you're not really in that way. Criticism is a gift. If you have a true growth mindset, free of ego, any criticism, a valid criticism, obviously, like if it's just your hair's shit, it's like, yo, I don't like that mustache. And it's like, no, this mustache is great. Um, hmm. If it's a legitimate criticism, your response should be thank you. Because yeah. that is identifying a hole in your game that you didn't know existed. And you've got it from this person for free. Yeah, maybe their intentions were them trying to bitch you. But like, f- fuck them. Don't matter. Like... <laughs> It's something. It's something I've, I've definitely, definitely had to learn. Like I said, I'm not someone that's got it all figured out and that ticks all the boxes in, in everything that I'm trying to be. You know, if I'm a coach, right? I'm a coach. I'm a business owner. Uh, I coach people, and I also try and, to some degree, coach my employees or the people that work for the business, or at least I need to communicate them to, uh, on a level. But the way in which I communicate to my wife or my child is very different. The way in which I need to communicate to the people that come into my gym when I'm coaching is very different to where I need to com- communicate to my brother and sister who work within with who work alongside me and sometimes they'll be like look the way you're speaking to me or the way the way you've communicated that or the way you've gone about it that's just not right 
And when it's my brother and sister, I'm like, oh, well, hold on a minute. And we get, we get into it. <laughs> yeah, well, into yesterday, you didn't put the, the, we, yeah. the cups in the dishwasher. <laughs> yeah. And then the day before, there was this dirt over the far side. But, but they're right. Like, if, if, I, if I'm trying to be all of those things, and communication is, we just pick on that as a, as a, as a skill set. And that's one of those skill sets I need. I need to take, take it into consideration that if I've, if, if I've quote unquote, em, employed my sister or she's an employee of the company, I need to be able to separate the ability to communicate with her as someone that is looking after her job, but then also separate that from someone who's then having to communicate with her as my sister, someone that I've, you know, who's older than me, who's, who's looked after me as a, as a kid and all the, all these things. So there is, it's just constant learning. It's constant learning. It's constant willing to, to want to learn. There's levels to this game, man. And talking to the older sister who you also work with, is probably up there with like the hardest. It's Sarah, right? Yeah, Sarah. Sarah, Sarah. Jane, yeah. Sarah uh, shout out, Sarah. Um, we were going to go into training for ages, man, but I've been loving this mindset stuff and I've got more mindset stuff I want to talk about. So I'm going to blast through a little bit of training. Let's say that we are back in the world of gym and that someone yep. or that someone has access to full kit. What are some of the workouts? couple of workouts that you've written recently that you've really enjoyed that you think some people could go away and do tomorrow? Uh, so my training, so just, just in terms of my philosophy or, or style of training now, so people have seen this sort of like train everything ready for anything type thing. And it, again, it's bought, bought, bought out of um, strength and conditioning based principles and what I used to do in the weight room that would transfer onto rugby field to allow me to, in particular sevens to allow me to be fast, powerful, strong, adaptable, all those robust, all those sort of things. Um, now for me being a bit older and having to wear those multiple hats that we've alluded to, it, it's training for me has to have high bang, for, bang for my buck needs to leave me feeling fulfilled. Um, it needs to be enjoyed. I need to enjoy it. It needs to be sustainable. It needs to be repeatable. I need to be able to train and then go and wear one of those hats that isn't the training hat, uh, whether it's the coach, the husband, the businessman, etc. So my training is very much different now to how it has been over the past. Um, I'll give you two, I guess, two workouts that uh, one, one strength based and, and, and one that might be more you know, aerobic conditioning type things. So for me, when we, when we, when we talk about our strength work, of course, we warm our bodies up appropriately based on any sort of compensations we've had in the past injuries, that sort of stuff. So I'll leave you guys you know, to your own devices with that. We then put together like a potentiation or movement prep type block, which will, which will mirror some of the exercises in which we're going to go into in the, in the key, in the main strength area. It might also have some of the exercises in which we're going to miss out because in that session, we just can't throw everything into it. So this talk session X that we're about to go into. So the, the key, the KPI for us, the key performance indicator will be a squat. Okay. So we always build it off these, these movement patterns. So within our movement prep, we will do a variation of the squat. So it might be a goblet squat, high bang for our buck, going to start, it's going to train the, the squat pattern, get our body aligned with what's coming up. We're going to get some some good a good amount of core bracing, anterior cores working nice and hard. So we're going to prime the body for what's to come through there. We then might put in a, a, a bit more of a core dominant exercise. So again, a hollow rock or a side plank clamshell. So again, bang for our buck, getting some lateral natural core uh, strength stability there. And we're also going to get some work through our glutes and we might just put an upper body exercise because then it's a lower body bias session. Um, so let's, let's, let's look at something like a, a press up, keep it nice and simple. Okay. So we've got 10 press ups, 10, 10 goblet squats, uh, 10 side plank camp clamshells each side. We would then go into our squat. That's our main KPI and whatever we're building through, if we're going through a training phase, we'll build to a heavy set of something. So I quite like now this, this notion of sort of auto regulation for my training. A lot of people, you know, this is much similar to a, like an RPE scale, given that unless you are an athlete, like I was when I was playing rugby and everything was constructed so that I should be able to hit a certain percentage on a certain day, unless I'd had a tough on pitch session or I had a bad night's sleep. Life is so dynamic that you almost need to take physiology on a 24 hour clock. Like, how are you feeling on that day? If you're supposed to hit a certain number, but you've slept really bad, you've had an argument with your husband or wife, you've not eaten, whatever, you know, the emails have blown up in your face. Someone wants to you know, punch you, you know, that sort of stuff. Just auto regulate based on how you're feeling. So if today's it's five reps, we build to a heavy five. All right. And we'll do that over, over five sets. Um, again, depending on time, we might pair that with an accessory exercise, something complementary. 
if you've got issues around um, you know correctives you could pair it with a corrective exercise so let's just say we're finding we've got really tight hips um, let's pair our back squat with a like a couch stretch or a, you know just a, a, a static stretch if we if we're a little bit further down our training journey we're intermediate advanced type type lifter we might pair something with a complementary pairing so it might be an upper body exercise we could go into a dumbbell floor press as we've primed with the press up it might be that we're trying to really make that a bias on, on a lower body session so we might squat build to the heavy five and we just pair that with a kettlebell swing so 12 10 to 12 swings so we're getting some power into the system as well so that'll be our five sets that's our kpi again we move into our accessory work if we're taking this session as a lower body session we then look at a unilateral pattern so maybe a split squat a lunge a step up something like that do you, always, look- do you always tend to have a a bilateral with a unilateral in there so if you were so again so for someone like someone like me who where training volume is quite high throughout the week and you know i'm able to train five six days a week um we, I, I would, I, I can go through like a lower body session, an upper body horizontal push pull, upper body vertical push pull, then a more hinge dominant session. So I have the ability to 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 stretch my session out over the week and get my volume in that that way. Um, for most people, when we're looking at bang for buck, if we're gonna if we're gonna pair the squat with the kettlebell swing, we can afford to go unilateral push pull in our accessory work. So um, we'll always put in a fair amount of unilateral and bi- bilateral work. So we might go, like I said, split squat um into a weighted push-up into a three-point dumbbell row um four sets of 10 on those and we always finish with either some uh, some pump work so some metabolic like stress pump work because again that leaves us feeling good we're very much aligned with trying to become obviously become stronger become fitter but aesthetics is, is a big driver for us it's a big driver for all humans no matter what they try to say even people in the crossfit world i still believe they you know performance driven they still want to look good um, so long as we, we get the balance right with that so we might finish with some upper body pump work or we might finish with a we might try and build that into a conditioning piece so some farmers carries with a ski erg um with some with some pull-ups um and, and do five rounds of that hopefully that gives you enough to sort of go with in, in terms of how we structure a, a strength session um again we take into each individual's you know training volume throughout the week um and then when it comes to just capacity work uh, fairly simple if it's monostructural i've just done one today which was which was 60 seconds on an assault bike 30 seconds rest 60 seconds on a um ski erg 30 seconds rest for 10 rounds so it's a 30 minute piece 20 minutes of work there's 10 minutes of rest cumulative um i gave myself some targets so on the assault bike i was aiming for 22 um sorry on the on the ski erg, i was aiming for 22 calories around i was hitting around average probably 21 so i always try and set the bar a little bit higher just to make sure i push my intensity a little bit and then the assault bike I was aiming for 20 calories. I think I hit 19 on average. Um, again, I don't try to push too much intensity when it comes to my conditioning pieces these days. I'll probably push intensity once a week. Um, but mostly it's just aerobic, a bit of headspace. I like to work up a sweat. Like, like you know, every, what everyone wants from a workout. Like, feel good. Feel as though you've got some work done. Feel as though it's quite high output. Um Feel as though you worked up a sweat and then allows me to go on with 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 over the rest of my day you know coming on a podcast having to speak um you know still got a coach later on this evening so it, it fits in that way hopefully that is that giving you enough i love it man absolutely great i like the idea of using the rpe scale um there's a number of different physios and world-class coaches that have been on this show talking about the importance of using the equivalent of a 24-hour window as you said there if you're if you've had a terrible night's sleep and an argument with your boss and you just got into a punch up outside in the car park and all the rest of it, your today's 70% is tomorrow's 50% or, mm. you know, you're just not going to be working at your best, but tomorrow you might be. So go in, see how you feel. But again, what did we talk about with that Confucian gentleman thing? You need to go in and have very structured sessions. This is the sort of progression that you are looking at. And then as you get towards that more intermediate, more advanced, there is a sense, there is insight into your training, into how you feel. Oh, actually, I can piece all of these different things together because previously I wasn't considering about whether I'd eaten enough over the last few days or whether or not I'm feeling stressed at work over the last few days. Uh, I, I like that. It seems having had Ryan Fisher on this podcast, the, the American Ollie March on, um, mm. I've, he has a lot of similar insights into training as you do, uh, take some of the functional fitness, uh, potentiations and, uh, and patterns, uh, but repurposes them into quite fun and different new ways. 
I think that's the, that's the main thing. I think you know, mixed modality fitness does allow you to explore movement and different patterns and energy systems and the way that you know, and it is it is so exciting and it keeps it keeps things challenged and varied in a in a more structured way. I think for most people sort of entering into it now, when we look at the Ryan Fishers of the world and the Marcus Phillies and those sort those sort of people, um, funnily enough, I did a bit of research a couple of years ago into into when functional bodybuilding started. Uh, and when I launched functional physiques and functional physiques came before functional bodybuilding, um, <laughs> because again, like I started as a bodybuilder, like I started as a bodybuilder because that's well, I started lifting weights at 14. We talk about these early adopters, like this, this is going back almost 16, 17 years. There were no 14, 15 year olds in the gym at this time. You know, I, that's when I started lifting, started lifting weights. So, um, bodybuilding was the thing, you know, just like most people that start lift, lifting weights back then you follow the magazines, you follow these people, um, when then did you start- when did you get your fitness menopause? When did you let go of the tether from bodybuilding post rugby and go into functional fitness? So I I went I probably I went into functional fitness like I like I said I started with with Saracens in the academy system from 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 15 years old weight started uh, coming in at like 16 17 like then 18 I'm playing full time full time rugby so I was the guy that because I was doing on pitch conditioning games in the gym lifting heavy weights my physique and the way i looked looked like the bodybuilder wanted to look but only when he was ready to like to compete sure, on stage right, yeah. yeah and my nutrition was always because again early adopter i was into nutrition i looked at the back then if it fits your macros and following the you know the people you know the the um lay nortons of this world and all that stuff that was first coming out and just being willing to just to listen to all this to all the research so you know they'd see meals and stuff that i'd eat and be like how would you eat that and look like that and just i just under, i just wanted to understand it so um i've digressed a little bit with that but my my training i, I soon realized that by trying to stay as strong as i could um one thing uh, when i was playing 15s you know they'd take our, our skin folds so trying to maintain as l- much lean muscle mass as possible and the ways in which you do that that became quite important to me from a young age Again, athletics background, I spent a lot of time down the track and doing sprint-based um, conditioning. That's very conducive with with building a nice, lean, powerful physique. So all of these things sort of started fitting together and I started painting this picture for myself. Okay, this is, this is how I do it. Um, don't get me wrong, there's some sessions where I was standing in front of a mirror and just, you know, do bicep curls. But... I needed to be I needed to be a good mover for the for the rugby field. You had you had a very early fitness menopause, man. That's 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 one of the earliest menopauses that I've heard of. I, but. I think I re- I think I really did. I really did. And I what I, I I remember going to the first couple of body powers and that sort of stuff. And people used to say to me, they're like, "Geez, when are you competing? Or when are you on stage?" I'm like, "Dude, I've never competed. I don't not compete. My, not my bag." Well, it's, it's the same. It's it's the same sort of funny argument about a lot of CrossFit. The intensity appears to be one of the key drivers of condition and that the challenge that bodybuilders have is keeping that intensity high it's not a natural environment when you're steeping in your own neuroses with your airpods in looking at yourself in the mirror it doesn't gas you up you can be listening to the the heaviest death metal or the brand new h track or whatever it might be but it doesn't gas you up the same way as a room of 10 other people all throwing down at the same time as you i actually think that if there was a group bodybuilding class like not not the ryan fisher march on marcus philly stuff i mean like fucking monday is chest and Mm. it's just chest but if you were to create bodybuilding classes i reckon you'd make some savage physiques out of that if you were able to have the community aspect the outsourced motivation aspect that you get with crossfit and with functional training and classes and stuff like that but it was just straight up eight to 14 reps con contraction focused mirror the entire room's mirror even the ceiling the floor's mirrored it's like a pawn pawn set and i reckon i reckon you get some absolutely beastly physiques out of that I think just just twofold here. Again, using the examples you've used, the Ryan's and the Marcus Phillies of this world. One, and even myself, going back to that foot, that foot, the fourteen years starting. Then, what, what what we have is a considerable amount of general physical preparedness. Right, we've done the bodybuilding bit. We've done multiple muscular contractions. We've tried everything there is to do. We've spent you know days, hours in the gym. So it's very hard for people to to um, to 
I guess under well, they need they need to appreciate that first and foremost when when they when they're entering into fitness. If you've only been in it two or three or four or five years, like spend some time building your your physique and doing the hard yards first, and potentially specialising in trying to gain some muscle for a period of time before you start worrying about shit. I need to do the metcon or the conditioning piece or go on a go on a run. Like just build some muscle first and foremost. Learn to move well first. So you, you know you, you nail your technique, drill your technique, stick to the basics. Progressive overload in everything in life is the way to, is the way to go forward, um, and that would be that that would be how you know how you sort of address that. Um, and then I think yeah, when it when it comes to then further further down that training journey, you can be you can afford to be a little bit more generalized because you've done the hard work and you've got those muscular contractions. And then training just needs to be whatever you fucking enjoy doing, whatever you can enjoy and repeat repeatedly do day in day out. Because if you just thrash yourself. And just push intensity, you're going to spend the rest of the day probably with your feet up on the sofa, or you're not going to be able to train the next day, and you're gonna you're gonna burn yourself out. And the last point you alluded to with the bodybuilding thing, or people that or people are training and just not getting in shape, it's because you train with no intensity. And by that we don't mean, you know, chase your anaerobic threshold every you know every 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 session and leave yourself dying on the floor. But it's like train with a bit of intensity that's not just standing there isolating certain muscle groups, doing body part splits each day. Because if you're doing that sort of thing and you're a desk worker and you're sitting behind a desk and you're going to be spending a long time. That's why bodybuilders, bless them, have to spend hours on an elliptical or cross trainer to, to cut weight and to, because they train with no intensity. And their, their lifestyle outside the gym isn't conducive with just like moving and, and trying to stay fit and healthy. Yeah, you're right, man. You're right. It's um, it's going to be interesting to see where the sport of fitness is goes over the next few years. Obviously, we've had a very recent change in CrossFit's direction um, over the last year and a half. The CrossFit HQ pivoted a lot more toward health than toward performance. I think that triggered an awful lot of people in the CrossFit community. <laughs> is it rightly so? I don't know. CrossFit is a business, a training methodology, and a sport. And trying to marry mm. all of those things at the same time is incredibly difficult. Say what you want about Greg Glassman and Dave Castro. They had challenging jobs trying to get CrossFit to be all things to all people. You're telling me that you want a training methodology that can get 60-year-old, 70-year-old Doris off the couch and moving with no pain in her hips and her knees, but you also want to create the fittest athlete on the planet. Oh, and actually it has to be a profitable business model as well. Anyone that thinks that they can do that easily is an idiot. I, I agree with you, but I also, what I will say on that is it's where, where I think they fell short on it. And this isn't a bash at, at CrossFit, just like our previous conversation was not a bash at uh, bodybuilders because to a large extent, I'm, I still am one and have been and, I, and, and there are some great ones. But CrossFit then didn't apply or didn't – there were some great CrossFit coaches as well, some great boxes. I, I'm friends with them as well, been, you know, been to them, some great places. They didn't – the model itself was a bit plug and play. No coaches really gained the knowledge in which when, – when, when CrossFit became about the games and the Matt Frasers, you just saw these CrossFit boxes trying to program like the games and what Matt Fraser did rather than actually go back to what CrossFit was designed to do, which was just meet the person where they're currently at. And – their narrative or the way in which they, they they depicted this 18 months ago when they started going down the health route was just – it was such – it was too far one yep. way. Yep. Like, I, I, again, if I liken this just to our gym, our youngest member is 14. Our eldest member is 72. We have, multi, we have a number of people who are in their 60s who will squat, who will do sled – like sled work, who will do – you know, med ball ground to over shoulder or variations of because there is a regressions and progressions matrix to every movement – pattern there is so long as you and you, you understand it and you know when to apply it and that is the art of, of coaching and programming which i think is where some of the crossfit stuff just got a little bit muddled because the sexy instagram stuff is the matt frasers and, the, and you know those top at crossfit athletes that are doing some gnarly shit um but people ask me you know what what we do is just a watered down version of of what we coach is a watered down version of what we do it's still some of the same movement patterns, same exercises, same bits of equipment, but it's meeting that person where it's at. What what Fra when I see Fraser do a workout, I'll just do a very, 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 very diluted, like a tiny <laughs> bit of, uh, diluted version of it because there's no point trying to aspire to be like that because he's at the very the very top of his game. You, you mentioned it earlier as well. Why would you choose to do a workout which you don't enjoy? 
everybody that is listening that is not a professional athlete does not have to train. You get to train. Yeah. The best training plan that you can do is the one that you do every day. The best diet that you can do is the one that you're compliant with and that you stick to. That means you need to find the sport, the physical training methodology, which is right for you. And sadly for you, it might not be CrossFit. It might not be functional fitness. It might be Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It might be trampolining. It might be ultra marathons. It might be Thai boxing. It could be any one of every sport that exists on the planet. And all that you need to do is do something that you enjoy. Yes, if you choose to do a sport which happens to have some loading in it and some progressive overload and some intensity, you may be able to get some more socialized benefits in condition, in the way that you look and stuff like that than you might be able to do if you get into French, you go to the top flight of French bulls or something like that. But the point is that your compliance is the key indicator, the key driver of your results. So just do the thing that you enjoy. If you've spent all day grafting away in the office, doing all this stuff, and then you get into the gym to do an, a workout that you hate, like, where you, no one has a bottomless pit of willpower to dig into. And then you've got to go home, you've got to get the kids sorted, all this sort of stuff. Nah, allow your time in the gym to be something that you indulge in. And I think the variety that you guys, yourself, Ryan, Marcus, uh, are bringing across. I saw Ryan today doing a landmine overhead single arm lunge so you can imagine mm -hmm. that you've got the barbell pivoted in the floor in front of you f far too much weight on it and he's doing it and i looked at that movement i've never seen anyone do it in the gym before but god i want to do it i look at i'm like that looks fucking sick i bet that a single abs and glutes at the same time i bet a single arm landmine mm -hmm. lunge is awesome i'm like that's fucking cool that is a cool new movement yeah, and I think with it, with it, all these moves, I mean, some 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 that come out are, are a bit novel, but I guess the purpose here is with with functional fitness and whatever that term means to people. The more you can try and look globally and engage full kinetic chain and get everything kind of working together. Again, this bang for your buck type thing. Um, so long as there is rationale and justification behind why you're doing it, I think the, these exercises are, are brilliant because you're going to get like you're going to get there's so much learning for the body. There's there's stability. There's balance. There's there's, coordination. Uh, there's, there's strength there's coordination there's there's you know, we're looking at contralateral loading patterns and 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 the body the body is having to learn all these different things and it's just building yes building like a, a more robust structure um just going backtracking a little bit though with what you said about just people buying into whatever works for them there are obviously some principles that people need to adhere to um and people are always going to fall you know fall short if and, and, and mainly that fort short, it comes always it would lead back to strength. So there needs to be some sort of underlying building of strength and whatever that may look like for you. But once we understand the principles of nutrition and training and, and progressive overload, then whatever method you choose is just something that you're going to you're going to enjoy. And that, for most people, that's going to be what is the lowest barrier, lowest hanging fruit to begin with, um, both financially, time, commitment and effort you know, to begin with. And that, that's absolutely fine because you need to start slow. And then as your training journey Im improves and you want to put more skin in the game and invest more into it, both time, finances, finances, et cetera, then you, you, you take the next step. And that is the beauty. That's why I, I'm so, that's why I don't even look back at my rugby career and think I, I, I wish I still played rugby because training is so pure. Like there is, there is always an opportunity to get better and learn. And, and, you know, that exercise, for example, you, Ryan, like, I've done variations of, you know, but, but not that, but this, there's an exercise that you can go, you can go and actually try and try something um, and see where, how you fare with it. And you can then progress that, 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 that exercise. And maybe then you can move from the, from the landmine press to, you know, the dumbbell press. And then you can look at some other no, no piece of equipment with it. Um, it's such a, it's, it's an amazing thing to be a part of. It's cool, man. Preparing the human body and the savages that you've got in your gym and all the gym owners that are listening as well. Mm -hmm. What lesson do you wish Ollie from five years ago knew? What lesson that you know now or what lessons that you know now? Ooh. If you could send a couple of notes back, is there anything that comes to mind? Um, okay, so I think one of my, the biggest struggles I've, I've had of recent times is trying to keep everyone happy. And I think as a coach and as someone that 
does try and help their neighbor a lot. Like I would give the person next to me my, my t-shirt and <laughs> not because I just want to be topless the whole time, but I would generally do that. Um, it's, you know, in recent times, I, you, you just can't keep everyone happy. And ultimately, if you try and keep everyone happy, the person that's not going to be happy is yourself. Now, I know that's that might be quite deep, but... No, oh, how, um, how did that manifest? With the COVID thing, mate. With the, with the COVID thing, what, what, what I realise is, and, you know, a few people that are further down the track, farther down the track of me, far bigger businesses and, and good mentors of mine. Are, and I'm very fortunate to have a lot of good people around me that, that have that helped me along the way, right? I didn't just stumble across any of this stuff. Um uh when 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 the gym needs to be closed i mean something like our gym we're very lucky that our gym is is we've got to that stage in business i, I listened to one of your, your podcasts i forget who it was and they were talking about the business hierarchy right and when you know the first thing is sales profit order and then we get to a stage where it's almost like this 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 long this bigger impact legacy. more impactful yeah well i think legacy was the last was the last stage stage five but whatever this stage four was it's about like uh, more than that time in which they spend within your gym so my gym, you know, particularly personal trainers as well. This isn't just um, exclusive to my business, but you'll hear a lot about that gym changed my life or that person changed my life because it might be a drastic weight loss. It might be that they suddenly get found more attractive by their partner or their sex life has improved or their confidence has improved or their their mental clarity and 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 just energy to be able to play with their kids has improved and it's changed their life, right? So when something like that happens for these people. And they've also got a financial commitment with the, with the gym um, and the gym. We've also got a friendship circle within the gym and the gym provides this, this route is part of their routine and there's community and there's all those things. And then it suddenly closes. Um, it's like what it was for me. Like you, your whole life just gets turned upside down. And then you've got all these people that not all of them say that for the same reasons are upset about some or about something, not only because there's a, you know, a killer virus on the loose, and that they, you know, their job security is gone, and that they're in lockdown, and they're, you know, and they're, they're now homeschooling. But the gym's also closed, and that was the X, Y, and Z to them. And I just found myself like having to feel all these conversations and 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 trying to keep uh, trying to appease everyone. And I think the bigger your circle gets, and the people that you serve, the harder it becomes to just try and keep everyone happy. And it's not for like lack of trying. Um, and I would always try, but it just gets to a stage where I'm just like, I'd go to bed at night and my, my, my stress, anxiety and depressive thoughts begin to creep in. So I think that answers your question in terms of like what I teach myself is that it, when you, when you're trying to grow a business, particularly in the service industry or where, where you have customers, you cannot keep, even with the best customer service and the best intentions, you can't keep everyone happy. Um, and the other thing I would say is just have better conversations. So if things are weighing on your mind or if it's a, a member of staff or one of your members or, or, or a family member, that's just have a conversation. Because, a lot, again, a lot of the a lot of the things that I've experienced over the last three, four, five years, when it's come to my relationship with my wife, my relationship with my brother, who's also my business partner, my relationship with some of the members, just get on the phone and just talk it out because no one's trying to come at you. Like no one's coming at each other from the, from the, from the wrong place. It's probably just a lack of communication or a misinterpretation or just trying to find out where that person's at, because it might be that they're just taking something out on you that it's really nothing to do with you. Um, I love the idea of having a conversation as quickly as possible. The concept from David Allen's getting things done called the next action and his solution to any to-do list item is as something appears in consciousness, I think, what is the next physical action that I can do? So it's a response. There's an equivalent in stoicism, the dichotomy of control. When something happens, is this within my control or is, is it without of my control? Mm -hmm. There's an equivalent here that you could almost apply where when you have an interpersonal challenge with someone, that your response is to bring it up as soon as possible that is appropriate. One of the main reasons for this that I've been ruminating about recently is there's an opportunity cost to not doing it. Every minute that you spend thinking about that situation is a minute that you could have saved by just having it. Mm. Have the conversation. Get it out of the way. Yeah, it's bad, but it's no less bad in four weeks' time. You've just wasted four weeks of your life thinking about it. 100%. Um, in, in everything, though, in, inaction is a killer. Like Inaction is a killer, and, and what happens is things just manifest themselves, and we talk about to-do lists and productivity and trying to get things done. This You're just adding more and more shite to this to-do list, which at some stage you need to address the problem. 
just like inbox it, just get it done. Like have the have the difficult conversations. Well, hopefully someone that's listening might be inspired by that. If you are thinking, oh, I've got this thing I've been putting off for ages. I need to speak to my dad about the way he spoke to me last week. Or I need to speak to my, my, my uh, boyfriend about why he keeps on doing that. Just have the conversation with them. Sit down, be truthful, be honest. Don't be passive aggressive. Don't be overly aggressive. Show your vulnerability. Be truthful with it and say, look, this is how it made me feel. What can we do? How can we work together to get past this? You know, it, it, that is the route to raising up everyone around you. Mate, that's- and that, 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 just that last bit on that, when you say working with people, I think that collaborative effect, like collaboration with people is so powerful. If you can, if you can collaborate and like I said, meet people where they're at where, and, and be willing to listen and also then guide that collaborative thing in, in, in any walk of life is, 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 is power. Effort is one of the few things that doesn't divide when you share it, it multiplies. Mm. Yeah. What area of self-development do you want to improve on most over the coming year? Oh, parenting. Um, I've got another child on the way coming in September. And my wife is honestly, anyone that knows Lauren, she is like one in a trillion. Uh, I guess because she's been with me for so long, she's she's been through the highs and the lows and just understands me. When I, when I talk to some of my best mates and friends who have – um amazing girlfriends and, and fiancés and partners and stuff like Loz just she just gets it she doesn't give me any stress um she's world world class wife man she's yeah top, she, top she, flight wife she, she really is but what i what i do understand is that we're coming out of, of, of covid hopefully sometime soon we need to build back a, a a vast um uh a vast chunk of our business that's been lost like it you know it's, it's impacted us as it has everyone else uh, and I have another child coming on the, uh, along that's going to, you know, be in around the same time. So those those hats in which I wear and those people that I identify as, I'm going to need to do some work on, on on those. And it's she is so good with our son Leo, but of course she's going to be, you know, her 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 abilities are going to be stretched. So that's something I really need to work on. Leo's getting to, to age now where he's actually beginning to to warm to me as his father figure a little bit more, um, you know. It's, and 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 I re- now is a really crunch time for me to build that relationship with him. Uh, I think for the first eighteen months, as much as I, you know, I I do believe I'm a, I'm a good father. Um, I've not been probably been as good as I could be if I if I'm really self critical. And, and and now that he's coming to an age and now where he's going to need me more, and also Lauren's going to need me more, and the new baby will need me more. I need to make sure that I get get that right. So that that's where I'm going to develop myself. That's awesome, man. Have you got any plans to read stuff? Are you considering taking courses or is this just to be as present as possible use the self-reflection and iterate on what works yeah that's always sort of that's always sort of worked for me and also i think again just a a more collaborative uh, effort with lauren and and i think like i look i know where i know where i fall short i know that i'm the sort of person when i get home and it's time to switch off and i get an email at 7 30 8 o'clock at night i try and answer it if i get if i wake up in the middle of night and it's you know and it's midnight and I, and I stupidly, I know you've always told me, keep my phone out of my room. But if I, if I, if I know that something needs doing that isn't going to affect anything, but I just, it will weigh on my mind. I'll try, I'll try and do it. So like you, you know, you, you've got no phone Sunday. I think you do, you do it. No, no it's phone Sundays. Um, there's things like that. that I need to be like, look, if I want to get home at whatever time it may be on, on these certain days, just, just get out. Like, I mean, last night I spent 20 minutes on the floor in my bedroom with Leo diving off the bed onto me for 20 minutes. He just jump up one side of the double bed, run across it and dive on me. And it honestly was so fulfilling. Um, and when I normally, uh, again, like I, I sit, I sit downstairs and I'm trying to decompress and I'm, I'm eating and I'm doing some shite on my phone, trying to, you know, filter through social media post uh, conversations that I haven't got back to. And I can hear Lauren and Leo like conversating in like baby language and her her talking and there's like giggles and fun and all this stuff and i'm like shit i should be up there man um so it's a it's a it's an effort and now i've put it out there and i'm gonna hold myself accountable to that it's just you know and again make it easy start slow i'll go and do two nights you know i'll go and get involved with part time a little bit more and then and then progressively overload myself into it because you know, we need to, need, you know, do yourself a bit of self-care. Don't try and throw yourself in the deep end because you'll set yourself up a failure. Progressive, o- progressive overload is king in all areas of life. That is the takeaway from today. Two fantastic podcasts that you should go and listen to if you are a young father or mother who is thinking, how can I make more time for my family? First off is my conversation with Greg McEwen, the author of Essentialism. He has 
his family as the most important thing in his life by a factor of 10 to everything else. And this guy's a New York Times bestselling author. So if his book is by a factor of 10 less important than his family, you begin to get an idea of how highly he holds his family. And I would suggest listening to Chasing Excellence with Ben Bergeron. I think he has a fantastic structure for the way that he pieces his daytime work running CrossFit New England, or CFNE now, uh, CF North New England and his family life together. He has some hard lines that you could implement into your life as well. Some stuff like uh, at 5 p.m. every day, he leaves the gym. He's out of the door, mm-hmm. whether he has a meeting with a client or whatever. He'll pack his bag at 4.59 and be saying, right, yeah, that's great, that's great. And then he's out the door and he's away because that's what Ben does. He leaves his phone in a box and blah, blah, blah. It's tons of different things. But as Ollie's mentioned here, start by being deliberate with your practice. You don't just get good at at lifting weights or doing a squat. You have to learn about hinging at the hips, then bending at the knees, then keeping your chest up, then tightening in on the bar. But after a while, it will become to begin to flow. But you have to put the work in. You need to learn. And especially when we have these things that don't necessarily have an instructor. You know, there's no, there's no one coaching you through being a parent at the moment. It's just this iterative mm. daily game where you can get caught up. So set yourself some bright lines, see how they work, and then reflect on it without judgment. Not everyone is going to be a perfect parent or a perfect athlete or a perfect coach or a perfect businessman or a perfect husband or wife or whatever it might be, but you can be a bit less shit than you were yesterday. And I think if you continue to try and iterate on that, you're going to end up in a good place. Yeah, two things on that. It's Greg, Greg McEwen, right? Essentialism. Um, I listened to the podcast. I actually bought the book off the back of it to give to, to give to one of my friends. And um, it, uh, there was something that really rung true with what he said there. When, whenever he goes on a business trip, he takes one of his kids with him. Sick idea. You know, just, it's just, in, it's just in, in, incredible. And it's like, you know, why, why not? Take the business trip on your terms with, you know, with, with your closest confidant, i.e. You know, your, your offspring, and take them with you. And uh, what a relationship that you're gonna, then going to have as a father. I, I, really, I, I really enjoyed that, that podcast. I took a lot from it. And then just that, that second bit you said there about, I mean, for me, like last night, that example, was just real positive enforce, reinforcement. It's like, okay, I've gone upstairs. It wasn't what I'd normally do at the time which I'd normally do it. And I had 20 minutes of just uninterrupted, amazing time with my son. Like that, that would only like compound interest, go up there again today, do the same thing, go to bed so fulfilled. Um, and what a perfect finish to the finish. Um, so yeah, we're, we're all learning. I love it, man. Look, Ollie, man, we made it. We made it. The internet asked for it and you fucking delivered, mate. So where <laughs> should people go? They want to find out more about you, what you do, the gym. What do you want to leave them with? Uh, so yeah, if you follow me on on Instagram, it's just at Ollie Marchon. Um, our services at the gym at www.marchon.co.uk. So programming, if you just want to reach out, we do new training nutrition. Um, if you just want to come and have a chat, just follow me on on Instagram. Slide into my DMs. I tr- do try and get back to people that that approach it with you know the right a bit of effort in in what they're trying to you know communicate across to me. Um, yeah, other than that, I, I promise Chris, like I, I've been waiting to come on this podcast, or we, we've been waiting to set this up for it. For a long time now, and I've been deflecting other podcasts and stuff because I this was this was it for me. Um, I think the only thing better than doing this is Joe Rogan, Chris. That's, uh, and then that's I, what's next for you, man. Chris is um, Chris has helped me with a little bit of setup for my own, for my own podcast. So in time, I, again, it's for me the podcast is just an opportunity to bring some of the people which I've sat at the table with and had good conversations with, um, and bring that to the people that, that follow me and interested in me. And hopefully, at some stage, I'll be able to. Um, tempt you with a bit of bait to come on that and and repay the favor i am ready if you can get chad sat opposite me with his mustache and this mustache (laughs) we can all wear our we can all wear our blue blockers and you can get the brownies in i think that's what a way to spend an afternoon is that Uh, going to be uh, the the march on podcast or something similar yeah i've I've toyed with names and stuff but we it's either going to be something yeah something around the march on podcast or or this earn it mentality but we'll, we'll see cool well if that is out before this episode goes up it'll be linked in the show notes below if not just follow ollie on instagram he puts up fantastic content great workouts and a pretty good rig in a great town as well so that's all man the internet's going to ask for this again so you probably get a better get a better get ready for round two yeah perfect to look forward to it mate thanks for having me on